So it all started at Imperial College in 2011 when uh, Sylvan came to Imperial to do a PhD. Uh, Sylvan doesn't have a degree in computer science, but I hope that he will soon have a PhD. He came with a vision about uh, what uh, should be uh, a good way to program fast, uh, reliable, concurrent uh, programs. And he has built, uh, he has convinced many, many people to, to follow that vision, and many people have uh, contributed to it. So there is a playground for Pony, there is a repository, there is a community. Uh, you can go and visit things uh, there. And uh, um, last week, uh, Wallaroo announced that they were uh, using Pony to develop uh, uh, their uh, streaming framework because Pony is fast, uh, reliable, easy to program, all the things that uh, we believe uh, Pony is good for. So Pony was developed with the aim to be able to help you to develop concurrent and also distributed programs, be efficient, and it should be easy to write correct code in Pony. And I'm going to talk about a couple of features in Pony and how those contribute to these aims of it. So in particular, I will be call, talking about actors, causality, capabilities, generics, termination, and garbage collection, or a subset thereof if I run out of time. Uh, first of all, actors. I think everybody's an Erlang programmer, so I have to whiz through that, yeah? Okay, so um, the paradigm was, uh, uh, so you know that stuff, I'm not going to, to talk about it. Um, what are actors in Pony? So actor is an active object and it has got state. And state is mutable. We love state. Uh, <laughs> the actors send asynchronous messages uh, to each other and when they re they receive, the actor receives such a message, it can take it off the queue and execute it and those are called the behaviors. And we also have got synchronous messages uh, which they can only send to themselves or to objects and from object to object and they are functions. And uh, what is very important is what is not in the slide. The messages can contain uh, mutable state. So you can give up part of your state, send it to somebody else, they can mutate it. So here is my fake uh, live programming, but I'm going to put a, a, on Twitter a URL where you can get all the programs. I cannot type very fast. Here is an actor, it's called ACT. It has got uh, two fields, um, an environment and a name. Here is the constructor, it's called new, it has got parameters, and uh, what it does is it initializes the field for the environment and the name, and there is a behavior what happens when you poke the actor, then it's going to print his name on the environment. And here is the main program. It's also an actor. In the, uh, when you create, when you start the main program, you create three acts. Uh, you give them their name and then you poke them. Not a very interesting program. What happens when you run uh, create, then uh, you, the main program will create uh, three actors. So this is supposed to be actors. These, uh, colored uh, uh, squares, and these elongated ones is the execution of behaviors, the arrows are is sending of messages. Um, causality. So let's have a look again at the example from before. I have got my main program. It has got uh, 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 the create um, constructor will uh, create the three actors, then uh, it sends to itself the run message and in the run it pokes the three actors. So, so what can happen is I have got uh, the actors again. It can happen that uh, the main program sends uh, the messages in order and then they are executed in order. It can also happen that while the actor is executing it uh, takes a break and something else is happening. So these uh, white squares are uh, say poses. It can also happen that even though the messages are sent in order, they are not executed in order. But it cannot happen that uh, uh, the, the third message, sorry, that the first message, the message to A, is sent last. And it cannot happen that uh, uh, the actor is executing two messages in parallel. So the messages are atomic in some sense. 
So there is some degree of uncertainty, namely, uh, what do the other actors do while I'm executing? And uh, uh, can they be changing this uh, mutable state that is sent around? Can I observe this change in uh, state? Uh, and, and also, in what order are sent messages sent and taken off the queue? So there are two ways that we alleviate the uncertainty. One is through types. So the type system says that, uh, in a way, the behaviors are atomic. When you take the message off the queue, it is as if you um, you have a unique access to all the state, and any modifications that you make are happening uh, atomically. And we will see how this happens. The other way that we alleviate uncertainty is through causal message delivery. And in order to explain this, OK, so the, what we have is that the messages arrive in causal order. And what is causal order? If I receive a message and then I send another message, then the first message uh, causes the second one. If I send a message and then I send another one, then the first message causes the other one, and the causality is uh, transitive. And what we have in um, Pony is that messages have to arrive in causal order. So uh, let's assume that we have a, a customer who has got uh, to, to demonstrate the issue. So the customer has got a store and a bank, and uh, what he does is he finds the price of something, he asks the bank to increment his uh, uh, account by the price, and then he asks the store to buy uh, the thing. And uh, the store has also access to the bank, and what it does is it, uh, when it receives the buy uh, message, it says to the bank, please debit the customer's account by the amount of money and pay it to myself. And the bank has got uh, uh, a lookup, uh, a map from customers to, uh, to their balances. Uh, there is a credit method that is going to uh, increment the balance of uh, the particular customer and the debit uh, uh, um, behavior that is going to uh, uh, re, um, subtract the amount from the balances, provided, of course, we don't get to be negative. Otherwise, there is an error. So we hope that this error will not happen. So uh, here is a customer. A possible, possibility, a possible scenario is that uh, uh, the credit method arrives first, then buy arrives at the shop, and the shop then sends debit. In that case, everything is good. It can also happen that... Uh, even though the credit uh, is sent first, uh, buy is going to be executed before credit. That's fine. But uh, debit is executed uh, after uh, credit. So we are still happy. But uh, uh, this situation is problematic. So if uh, credit was to uh, be sent uh, first, but somehow be taken off the queue after debit, then uh, we could have a, a negative balance in the uh, account. So in the particular case, because uh, this scenario cannot happen because uh, credit causes buy, buy co uh, cr uh, causes debit, therefore credit causes uh, uh, debit, and therefore, uh, and therefore by causal message delivery, credit will be delivered before debit, so everything is good. So, good. Uh, the question is, is that a day, um, an expensive feature to have in uh, the programming language? And is it an important feature to have in a programming language? So the first uh, about the, is it expensive to implement, uh, we have got a recent paper where, so is it expensive to implement? If you are on one node, no. Pony has got a, a, a very efficient implementation of uh, queues. Uh, which uh, uh, for the one node implementation and uh, uh, everything works uh, fine. If you are in a distributed setting, what we have um, in Sebastian's uh, um, uh, project uh, thesis and also in that paper, if you have organized everything in a tree topology, then causality is guaranteed. And we have got a model where we can uh, prove that. 
um, of course, uh, without uh, need to store any further metadata. Of course, the, the main question is, do we need causality? So we need causality for garbage collection. However, there are some further ideas uh, that um, for a new protocol when you are in the distributed setting, so we can dispense with causality for uh, garbage collection. We also need causality in the distributed implementation because there are some protocols where, which allow the actors to move around in, uh, the, in the topology and there you need causal message delivery. And you often need causality in the application. So uh, I leave this as an open question. Um, I'm going now to talk about the type system. So the type system has got various concerns. First concern, I have got a reference. What can I do with it? What is it safe to do with that reference? Um, then with this reference, what, what will I be doing? I will be writing into it. I will be reading from it. We have got objects. I can be uh, aliasing it. I can assign the path to this object to some other path. So what happens when I alias uh, the reference? Similarly. Um, uh, this should say, what if I unalias, sorry, replace the R by an L. Um, so uh, when I um, update a field in an object, then th what the uh, field was pointing to has got one less alias. So this is another uh, question that is reflected in the type system. And finally, um, what if I use my reference to read its field and uh, call methods from it? So to answer this first question, we have introduced uh, reference capabilities. Um, for the second one, we have got the novel concept of aliasing capabilities. The, so the operation that happens uh, in, through the execution of the program is somehow uh, reflected in the type system. Similarly, unaliasing, removing an alias, is also reflected in the type system. And finally, when I go through a reference in order to access a further object, we have got the concept of viewpoint adaptation. And now I'm going to talk about these four things. Um, so the reference capabilities, they are attached to uh, paths. They are not a property of uh, the object. They are a property of how I can look at the object. And uh, what they express is uh, whether the holder of this reference is allowed to read or write in the object, but they also express whether other aliases are allowed to read or write. So we have got this uh, uh, concept of capability, not only as what am I allowed to do, but what others are forbidden from doing. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, five capabilities, but there are more capabilities. I'm, I'm trying to keep it a little bit uh, simpler. So what is uh, the holder allowed to, to do? Is, are they allowed to read and write? So if I have an ISO, an isolated reference, then I'm allowed to read and write. If I have a ref reference, I'm also allowed to read and write. So this will be differentiated later on. Uh, if I have a val or a box reference, I'm only allowed to read and write. And if I have tag, then I'm not allowed to do anything. Um, now we distinguish between what the local aliases are from, forbidden from doing and what the global aliases. The local aliases are aliases that come to that object from the same actor. The global aliases are those that come from other actors. So. If I have an isolated reference, I forbid the local aliases from reading or writing, and the forbid is indicating through red. I'm afraid that this is green, but it doesn't come out as green in your, on, on the projector. Um, so the difference between ISO and REF is that ISO says I'm the isolated, I'm allowed to read and write, and nobody else either global or local is allowed to read and write. Whereas the ref says, uh, I'm allowed to read and write. I don't forbid the local aliases from reading and writing, but I forbid the global aliases. 
Um, similarly, with the VAL reference, uh, we forbid the local and the global aliases from, uh, uh, from writing. So they, what it means is everybody has agreed that this is a value and they are going to keep it unmodified. Whereas the box is a kind of a union type between the two. It says between ref and val, it says I don't forbid the local aliases from uh, doing anything. They can read or write. Only I am not allowed to write. And uh, the global alias is uh, definitely not going to write and I don't know what it's uh, doing. And uh, uh, tag says uh, uh, I, uh, I am not allowed to read or write, but I don't forbid the others. I am agnostic about the others. So here is an interesting point. Ah, so as a result, uh, I, I spoke earlier about sending stuff around. As a result, I can send the ISO. If I give up the ISO, I know that nobody else is going to read or write. So if I send it to somebody else, then they can receive it as an ISO. This is the way that we can communicate mutable state in a safe way. So I give up modifying it. I send to somebody else. They can modify it when they are done, and so on. Um, if I have a value, then we can send the value to others uh, because everybody, they are going to treat it as value as well. And if I have a tag, I can send it uh, around too. Um, as an interesting uh, uh, comment, this... Um, this capability was not something that uh, we, we were thinking about when we started the discussion, but it came out when we wrote uh, this table, and then it uh, turned out to be extremely useful, because quite often all you need about an object is the identity of the object. You don't need to go inside and, and read its stuff. You just need to know uh, what is uh, his address and pass it around for comparison and so on. And there is another one that comes in between, which also came as a surprise, and for which it's called transition, and for which we found the uses later on. OK, so uh, I was talking about uh, aliases and what they are allowed to do. So uh, given that I have, uh, let's say, I have a, um, a local alias, I have a, a pointer, the customer um, um, the, the customer actor has a, a path to account to the object account, which is an ISO. What is the local alias allowed to be? Well, since the local alias is not allowed to read or write, it has to be tag. Similarly, if the customer has got a ref uh, path to the account, then the local alias can be ref box or tag. So the local alias is allowed to uh, read, write, and, but it's not allowed to assume uh, more, uh, uh, um, any uniqueness. If it is a val, the local aliases have to be val, box, or tag. And if it is a box, if uh, it allows reading and writing from the local aliases here, then, it is, then the local alias is uh, these guys, ref, val, box, and tag. Um, so here is our live coding session in, without live coding. I have got a, a class person, and he has got identity and strength, and uh, he can eat some food, and uh, uh, the food has got calories, and, uh, and it has got a function that says uh, take bite, which will reduce the calories in the food and give some bite, uh, calories back to the person who eats it. And in the main program, I have got uh, some apple, which is a field in the actor main. And, uh, and here I've made a copy mistake, I'm sorry. Uh, and here I've got my method uh, run, where I'm creating two people, and then I'm asking the people to eat the apple and the pear. They take two bites each. So where are the errors? OK, speeding live coding. Here, I have got a function that says my receiver is a box. You have to treat me as a box when you use me. But I went and modified the state. So that this is not allowed. I need to repair it by saying my uh, making the receiver a ref. But now the, mm, 
Now, there are other problems in that uh, this function call is no longer uh, correct because uh, the argument was a box, and I put, uh, uh, I called the function that wants the receiver to be a ref, so I need to repair that too. Uh, and now everything is happy. So now we look at global aliases. We have a, a customer who has got an ISO reference to account, and the bank might also have got a reference to account. Well, all it's allowed to do is have a tag uh, alias. If uh, the customer has got a ref reference to account, then the bank is only allowed to have a tag again. Uh, if uh, the customer has got a val reference, then I'm allowed to have also val box and tag because he's not going to modify them uh, and so on. So here is another live coding session. Uh, we have uh, the, um, uh, I have changed the, prev the earlier example so that the, uh, the person is an actor now and he has got a behavior for eating. And otherwise I'm doing pretty much the same as I did before. Okay, so where are our problems? So the first problems are here because I am saying that I have got a ref reference to person, but the person is an actor. So the, the, the actor will have his own isolated state. The only way that I can refer to an actor is if I consider them as tag. I'm not allowed to go and modify the actor. The actor is in charge of his own state. Once we have done this, we have got problems with calling this function uh, on uh, the two people, on Jan and Lori, because I am passing uh, um, these pears and apples, which are uh, uh, ref um, references. So uh, here, main has got a mutable access to ref and pair, and I'm uh, passing it to the actor. So I would be creating uh, illegal uh, global aliases. So the only way that I can give the apple and the pear in such a way that uh, uh, Jan and Lori can take a bite is if I make them ISOs. So I have to make the pear into an ISO. And then uh, uh, I need, before I pass the pear to Jan, I need to consume it. I need to make sure that I give up my own access to the pear so that ca uh, Jan can eat it. And uh, similarly, I have to make uh, uh, the uh, local uh, field uh, an ISO. And uh, when I pass it, I must make sure that, uh, um, that this field is not, the contents of the field is not longer accessible here. I'm going to show a little bit more of that later on. OK, so that was about what the capabilities are now aliasing a capability. Uh, let's look at uh, this example where I have got two ISO variables and I assign one to another one. And here I have uh, uh, an, um, an ISO variable and I pass it where in the behavior when an ISO is expected. So should those be type correct? So they shouldn't be type correct and why not? Well, in the first case, I have got two different um, ISO variables, and each of them points to its own isolated object. But through the assignment, I have now made uh, uh, aliases, two, two ISO alias each other, and this is forbidden. And similar story here, I had an ISO reference to an apple. Now I pass the apple as an ISO in the message, so I have got aliases through the messages to, to the same uh, object. And uh, I have uh, broken all the promises of ISO. So how can we do that? We need to consider what it means to alias an object, and we will uh, think of this in terms of the capability. So we have got an operator that takes a capability and makes the aliased version of the capability. So here is... Uh, the operator applied to all the capabilities that we know so far. And uh, 
as long as we are not in exclusive land, the operator is idempotent. But when we make uh, um, an alias of an ISO capability, then we have to become tag. Then we, have, uh, we, we don't have any rights anymore. The next point is consuming or unaliasing a capability. So uh, let's consider the uh, example uh, that I'm giving uh, here. I have got uh, two uh, ISO variables. And then what I do is I assign to Y a new fresh ISO. This is what Recover uh, does. I'm not going to, to explain it. And the result I uh, uh, assign to, the result of this assignment I assign to x. So what happens is that I start with uh, x and y pointing to different uh, uh, isol isolated objects. And then I make, uh, uh, through this um, assignment, I make y point to the new a object. And the result of the assignment is the old um, uh, left-hand side of the assignment. So it, it is what uh, Y used to point to, and this I assigned to X. So the, um, the, the assignments always keep track of what the old value was and extract them so that I can uh, reuse the old value. So what has happened uh, here is I have got a temporary access to this object, which has uh, one less... Uh, um, Actually, if I had forgotten this, uh, uh, if we forget this left-hand side, if we forget what happens to x, what we have here is a temporary uh, variable that points to the ISO, and it, it has one less alias than there were, than uh, originally. And uh, similarly here, I had an apple that is ISO, and then I consume it. So what happens is that... Uh, uh, this uh, 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 apple doesn't have this um, the, the doesn't have a reference through a, and it has got a new fresh reference to it, uh, which uh, which is temporary and therefore has got one less uh, um, uh, one less alias. So again, what happens in both cases? We remove the stable alias and we make a temporary alias. And what is the type of this temporary alias? We need uh, this operator that says, I remove uh, an alias from you. And uh, this we represent through this hat. So we have a new capability that says, I'm an ISO, but I'm temporary, so you can alias me. And uh, therefore, now we need to think, what do these operators mean for, each all, for all these guys? And uh, as long as we are in the capabilities that don't require exclusivity, they are, again, idempotent. But uh, here, if I have got uh, an ISO and I unalias it and alias it, then I will get back an ISO. If I unalias it twice, then it is as if I unaliased it. The last uh, point to discuss is viewpoint adaptation. So here I have got uh, a couple... Uh, a class B with a lot of fields that are not very interesting, but uh, their, their name says what they are. They are I, S, or F, Val, and so on and so on. And the class test with uh, uh, variables. And the question is, uh, I have got an ISO reference and then an ISO field. What am I allowed to do with it? What is the capability? Similarly, uh, if I do that and then I want to assign to the fref field, is that valid? And so on and so on, with uh, B reference and val and so on. So what is happening is uh, we, we look from, uh, uh, we go first to one object and then to the next one. And we desc describe this through the viewpoint adaptation operator, which says if uh, object one looks at two through capability kappa, and two looks at three through capability kappa prime, then what is uh, uh, one's opinion about three? What is it safe for one to think about three? And this is the viewpoint adaptation operator. So I'm going to skip the definition of this in the interest of getting to more stuff. So here is the, um, 
but just have, let's have a look. There is a table that uh, uh, describes how viewpoint adaptation works, and uh, there are explanations why viewpoint adaptation works this way. So what guarantees does the type system give me? It gives me several guarantees. It says, first of all, there is no data races. So if one uh, actor can look at an object through capability kappa, and the capability is writable, so if it has uh, the ISO or REF capability, if the other actor has got uh, uh, an access to that uh, object, then it can only be through tag. So that's nice. Uh, it also means that immutability is deep and permanent. So if I have a reference to something as val, then everything that is accessible from it is also val, and also it will never become less than val. Uh, it means also capabilities get weaker with the distance. So if I have a path that has uh, uh, capability uh, kappa, then the shorter path would have stronger capabilities. It gets weaker with time. I'm going to skip that. And the most beautiful uh, of all is that there is this figment of atomicity. So what it means is that, uh, let's say, I start with the configuration C, uh, and um, uh, I'm executing in my own state, and I get to, to in, sorry, an actor is executing in parallel with other actors, we get to configuration C prime. And in the meantime, I, the actor has not received any messages. Uh, and if the actor can see an object as non-tag, so can read it, and the object has changed, then it was this actor who changed the object or who created it. So in other words, here is what the semantics of Pony allows. It allows me to start the behavior, then the other actors do some stuff, then I continue my behavior and so on. But as a programmer, I don't need to keep that in mind. As a programmer, I can think that uh, my own behavior is atomic, that the whole world stopped when I started my, my program, I execute my program, then the others take over. OK, generics. I'm going to go very fast through generics. So all these operators that we saw now play a role with generics. Here is an example of a, a simple box thing in which I, can, which I can create. I can get the contents out of this. I can update it, and I can clone it. And it is parametric with x that is makeable. Now, capabilities play a role here. And uh, uh, the operators of uh, viewpoint adaptation and uh, unaliasing, aliasing uh, play a role. And the viewpoint adaptation is from, can be from the view of the receiver or fr from the view of another generic parameter. So uh, capabilities and all these operators play a, a role with generics and make the system uh, pretty powerful. Um, so is the type system too complex? I would say uh, no, it is not too complex. I just was not given enough time to explain it to you. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's one thing. The other story is it's not that complex uh, you, when you use it, you don't need to understand how it works. The compiler uh, helps you. But th the best answer, I think, comes from this blog from Wallaroo, where they say, usually it was not too complex. When I got errors, I got them for a good reason. And anyway, do you want to find your own data races, or do you want the compiler to help you? There is also a paper about the type system, and I hope we will have a uh, Better one soon. OK, uh, termination. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that. Garbage collection. So I did not know how important garbage collection is, but I'm sure you know it. Uh, I have heard that uh, in times of crisis, uh, banks turn off garbage collection because uh, it uh, makes the behavior of the program unpredictable, slow, and so on. So, of course, Silva knew it, and uh, garbage collection is a very important part of the design of the runtime, and I'm going to give you a 
an idea of uh, pony garbage collection. So garbage collection in pony is fully concurrent with the execution of uh, behaviors. So here are uh, the actors again, and oops, no. Here are the actors again, and the black stuff is garbage collection. So the, the, the actors can alternatively be executing behavior and garbage collecting. This is what the, proto the garbage collection protocol uh, allows. But we have also run some tests, and we have measured that this is the case. So here are the actions of various uh, actor, of actors on four cores, and the black stuff is garbage collection, and you see that it is interleaved with the rest. So how does it w work? What are the challenges for fully concurrent garbage collection? One is who collects the objects. How do I avoid data races between garbage collection and uh, the mutation and between uh, uh, normal behavior of actors? How, does, uh, how do we know, OK, um, I'll skip this one, and I'll skip this one because it will become clearer. So the first question, who collects the object? It is answered by the actor who created the object, and this is often called uh, the owner. How do we avoid data races between garbage collection and mutation? The type system does it. So when you need to go and uh, scan uh, the, um, the state accessible from an actor, you, you only scan the parts that you are allowed to read. And you know that when uh, another actor is uh, executing, they are not allowed to modify what you are reading. And therefore, there is no problem. It's wonderful. Uh, now, how does the owner know when there, whether an object that it cannot reach cannot be reached by other actors? Because he can be, have given, he can have created the object and then passed it on to another actor. So there is a scheme with deferred reference counts and messages. And how do we deal with uncertainty in message delivery? As I said, we have causal message delivery in the particular protocol. In other protocols, we don't need causal message delivery. How long do I have? Five minutes? OK, so I'm going to go. V so this is what our protocol is called. It's called ORCA. Um, and I'm going to, OK. Perhaps I will just skip all of this and uh, get no, I will not skip it, sorry. So as I said, the actors give a reference, uh, keep a reference count for the objects that they, they own. And uh, there is the invariant that says, nah. if an object is reachable from a different actor than the owner, then the owner will have a reference count greater than zero. <coughs> So if I have uh, uh, this, uh, if I have this setup with actors alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and alpha two can uh, has uh, owns all this object, alpha two is responsible for collecting the objects. So let's think how garbage collection could work. We have got our invariant that tells us you know when an object is uh, useful to the other actors. So um, in the particular case, the objects that are reachable from a foreign actor are 3, 5, and 7. And what the garbage collection does is it marks all objects uh, that it knows of as unreachable to start with. Then it finds all objects that are reachable from the current actor and marks them as reachable. Then it marks as reachable all local objects that have a reference count greater than zero. So now everybody has been marked as reachable except for this one. Uh, then it collects all local objects that are marked as unreachable. And is that sound? Yes, because of our invariant uh, two over there. Is that safe? Yes, because there are no data races. And can this uh, scanning be done more efficiently? 
this is the cost that uh, uh, Orca has to pay upon uh, garbage collection and also upon message send and receive. We have to scan the heap or scan the, uh, the messages. Uh, but it can be done more efficiently when we have more knowledge, when we know that what we're sending up around are value things. So skipping all the rest, Very beautiful animation. I want to get to our uh, um, Okay, so we have got some preliminary benchmark results. We do not have uh, large programs. We cannot uh, uh, do um, benchmarks on uh, all of um, uh, on any large program, therefore we developed programs that would reflect the various, uh, um, where we expected weaknesses of our system uh, uh, to be. So we, d we looked at scalability, footprint, responsiveness, and compared uh, uh, execution with and without garbage collection. And we looked at the examples that came from the language benchmark game, essentially, passing around, uh, uh, working on trees, working on bigger trees, working on rings, working on rings that pass around uh, trees, uh, mailbox, and uh, server simulation. So here is the example where we are comparing with uh, uh, Orca and uh, Aka, uh, um, where uh, Aka is running on the JVM, so we use the C4 in order to compare. And we are running on 4, 8, 16, blah, blah, 64 cores. And we are distinguishing between the time it takes to execute uh, the program versus the time that it uh, takes to do concurrent GC, stop the world GC, and the uh, overhead for, for the mutator. So this is the example for trees. And uh, uh, we are very happy with the result. Uh, with uh, bigger trees, we are even happier with the result. With the rings, uh, super happy. With the mailbox, we are happy. And with the footprint, with the footprint, we are not that happy. And the reason is that here we are building huge data structures, and we cannot garbage collect within a behavior in, uh, in the ORCA implementation. The protocol allows it, but it is too uh, cumbersome to implement uh, running through the stack. We do not have that and we pay a price. Uh, with and without GC, not that interesting. Responsiveness, here we measured, the, the, we, we fired a, a sequence of um, similar jobs and we measured the difference in response time. So the difference in response time in Orca is uh, very small and we uh, saw uh, big differences in uh, the other implementations. Uh, and here we are in the case, I think, of the heavy ring, and we're not doing well at all because you can see that we have uh, 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 Erlang uh, uh, here. So, uh, Erlang is these guys, and we are here, and we're not, we not doing well at all. So uh, there is a, a paper about uh, this at Uppsala presented two weeks ago. And more stuff about garbage collection for actors, which I think I should skip. So in, uh, in, in summary, I have spoken about some features of Pony. Uh, Pony was developed, uh, uh, um, the, the, type, the language Pony was developed with a view to have a certain runtime, and the runtime has affected the development of uh, the type system for Pony. Uh, there is a community around it. It, it is getting uh, adopted more and more. There are open problems to which you can uh, uh, contribute if you are interested. And I, in particular, I am interested in further ideas to, impr to improve uh, the type system and garbage collection. Thank you. Thank you.